my name is Chris Giddings, and I'm, a, I'm an NFL agent. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I like Jerry Maguire. <laughs> I hear that a lot. Uh, it's going to be on my, great, on my tombstone someday. He was like Jerry Maguire. <laughs> it's okay. It gives people a frame of reference for what I do and, and kind of helps them understand a little bit about, about my job. Although uh, there were some things that were obviously not correct in the movie, um, but there were some things that, that kind of were. I get to do some pretty cool things. Um, anyone here going to the Super Bowl this week? No? I'll, I'll be there uh, just for the week. I'm, I'm not going to stay for the game. But um, this was Super Bowl uh, 46, uh, Patriots, Giants. And I had a client, Danny Woodhead, who played for the Patriots that year. And in my business, getting to go to the Super Bowl and watch your client play is probably about as good as it gets. And I remember one of my favorite memories from the week was talking to the Woodhead family uh, right before the game. And my seats weren't with them. And I said, man, I am so excited. You know, if Danny scores, somebody call me. Because if, my, if I don't answer, you need to come up and do CPR or something. Because I'm probably, I could be dead. I don't... And three. They can't get a first down without getting the touchdown. And Brady in the gun. Brady moving and looking and has time. And then throws. And that is caught for a touchdown by Woodhead. Tom Brady had all that time. And Brady telling us the other day, he said, I'm tired of hearing about the Giants' pass rush. I've got the best offensive line in football. Yeah, how about that? <laughs> I was, uh, this was the go-ahead score right before the half. Danny had had uh, actually several big plays on that drive. Um, I'm just on top of the world. My phone rings. <laughs> hey, Stacia, how are you? Yeah, that was great. No, I'm alive. No, no need to do CPR. Yeah, I hope he scores again, too. If he does, call me, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Those kinds of moments are, are pretty awesome, and uh, I don't think that I'll ever forget them. Let's talk a little bit about facts and figures uh, in the NFL, some things that maybe uh, might be of interest to you. There's approximately 700 players on NFL rosters. That's on the 53-man roster. Teams are allowed to have 53 guys on that roster during the season. Those are the only guys that get paid the, the higher amount. They do... Uh, also have 10 players on the practice roster, but those players get paid significantly less. Most players uh, on those rosters, they don't make the millions and millions that you see in the media. Most players make league minimum, which is 435,000 to 1 million, depending on how long you've been in the league. And the 1 million are for guys who uh, have been in the league for 10 years or so, which is very few. The average career in the NFL is only 2.8 years. That's it, 2.8 years. That's the average, and that's skewed by some people like Peyton Manning or Tom Brady who've played in the league for a long time. Why is it uh, 2.8 years? Well, there's a couple reasons. Some of you may know who this, uh, this player is. This is Casey Fitzsimmons. Casey played here at Carroll College for Coach Van Deest. He was a client of mine and a, a, a friend of mine. And I'll tell you what, I hate this picture. I hate it. This was Casey Fitzsimmons' last play. This was the end of his career, seven years with the, the Lions. Um, he retired after this play with concussion-like symptoms. And injuries are a big part of the league, but uh, particularly concussions are scary. And th this one in particular scared me um, because, again, he's my friend. The other reason is um, that, that careers are only 2.8 years. There's no guarantees. Most of the contracts are not guaranteed. You'll see sometimes these big contracts where, where players are getting this big bunch of guaranteed money. Very few players get that. For most players, you can, get, you can be uh, you're paid on 1 17th. Okay? So there's 17 weeks in the season. You get paid 1 17th. If they release you, that's it. You got one week. Right now, this time of the year, as teams are done, they're allowed to expand their rosters to 90 players. But they're really going to start the process right away 
of cutting those players down. If they draft somebody, then they've got to release someone else. And it's just this constant process. And it culminates in August and September during the cutdown days. During two cutdowns, the NFL will cut 1,200 players. Remember, they only keep 1,700. 1,200 players, most of those players will never play another down of professional football. Some will, either on other teams, or they may get the opportunity in the Canadian Football League or something else, but most are done, 1,200 players. Um, if you make the team, that isn't necessarily a guarantee that you made the team for the year. I saw this with Danny Woodhead when he was with the Jets. He made the team, made it through the cuts, played in their Monday night game, played very well, and the Jets released him the next day because they needed a roster spot for a defensive player. Fortunately, he got picked up by the, the Patriots, and the rest is history, but uh, you can get cut at any time. In fact, if you're a player and you're in the, uh, in the, the, the offices on Tuesday, which is typically their day off, you'll see a group of guys that they bring in for tryouts every week. And they're looking to see if those players are better than somebody that's on the roster. They might be guys who played in the league, some of them maybe for a long time. Like the Patriots signed Steven Jackson midway through the season. That meant somebody had to get released. Think about that in your own jobs. If your employer brought in people every week and tried them out and found somebody better than you, it doesn't... This Philosophy doesn't just extend to the players, it's also the coaches and the scouts and the GMs. Roughly 20% of the jobs in the NFL turn over every year. This year, we've already had seven head coaches that were fired along with all their staffs two, and two staffs where they kept a head coach, but they fired everybody else. This makes for a lot of uncertainty for the players and the agents who have to deal with this. We have new scouts, new coaches on teams every year. Let's talk a little bit um, about the idea of the diamond in the rough. I hear this uh, quite a bit as an agent, um, and uh, you know, because I've, I've represented players like Casey and Danny Woodhead and some others. The, the diamond in the rough. I get a call from maybe a coach or a player or a family member, the NFL is overlooking my player, my, my kid, or whatever. Each NFL team will uh, do scouting reports on what they consider to be the top two to 3,000 college players every year. They're only, going to, they're only going to draft 250 total. That's all the teams combined. And they're going to sign another 450 as undrafted free agents after the draft for 700 total. So out of two to 3,000 who have scouting reports, about 700 will get opportunities to play. That's it. So if a player isn't in that group, they're a long ways away from getting an opportunity. But that's how sophisticated the current scouting systems are in the NFL. This is a great picture. I love this picture. I think there's a perception that uh, a lot of players have off the field, a lot of off the field endorsement money and whatnot. And it's true for Peyton Manning and, and those guys. Yeah, they get, there's plenty of that. Um, this is a picture from Jerry Maguire, and uh, this is uh, Rod Tidwell, right? He's going to do a, a commercial for a sofa company or something. And his wife, Marcy Tidwell, is upset at Jerry that he's doing sofa commercials. She says, Shoe, car, clothing line, soft drink, the big four the jewels of the celebrity endorsement dollar. She's, she's not happy he's doing sofa commercials, but the reality is that, that a lot of players would be happy to do um, sofa commercials if we could get the opportunity for them. This is Danny Woodhead, and um, he's doing a, we had a deal with Skechers for a couple years, great company, this is a great deal. We were shooting a commercial here in South Boston, and uh, it started to rain, we went over to these steps, um, got some great photos, um, these old concrete steps, and this, it ended up in, in uh, some magazines. This was a magazine uh, print that they ran for a while. Um, social media is an area where a lot of players now can, can make a little bit of money off the field. Companies have learned that they can use athletes to do Facebook posts, Twitter feed, um, and mention their company, and they, they don't have to pay a whole lot of money sometimes. This is one that, that Danny did with Tide. 
This is Jeremiah Searles. He's an offensive lineman for the Vikings, and he's talking at a Team Jack Foundation um, fundraiser. Team Jack is the, probably the, the leading um, pediatric brain cancer research um, group in the, in the country. Sometimes we just get to do some really cool stuff. Um, this is Dana White. He's the head guy for the UFC. Danny and I got to go and be a part of um, UFC in Omaha, and we got to spend some backstage time with Dana and uh, get to know him a little bit. He's a big Danny Woodhead fan. That was, we met all the fighters. It was, it was a great memory. This is how I prefer to remember Casey, and Casey epitomized this saying that we have in the NFL. There's so many things about the NFL that you can't control. You can't control who they draft. You can't control uh, if they're going to cut you. But you can, you can focus on what you can control, which is preparing. I called Casey Fitzsimmons on draft day in his second year. He had started 11 games as a rookie, which was unbelievable. And on draft day, I called him because there was this rumor that the Lions were going to draft Kellen Winslow in the first round. And if they did that, that was going to change his role. So I was, I was kind of freaking out about it. I called Casey. I said, hey, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to the gym. I said, you're not going to watch the draft? He said, Giddings, why would I do that? I can't control that. I'm going to the gym. So he was... He was focusing on what he could control, which was preparing for the next year already. What's it like being an agent day to day? Well, it's fantasy football for real. <laughs> <laughs> People ask me all the time who my, favorite, uh, who my favorite team is, and I say, anybody who's employing my clients. It's really true. My family and I, we get all, you know, we've got a whole box full of gear from different teams. It's like a guy gets signed by the Chargers. Whoa, Chargers, we're going to pull the Chargers out now. <laughs> but it's, tr it's really true. We, uh, we're capped at 3% uh, total. We, we cannot take more than 3%, and that's only if a player gets paid. If they make the team and they get paid, we get 3% of that. That's it. And a player can terminate an agent anytime for any reason. And it happens because agents are constantly trying, other agents are tr constantly trying to steal your clients. Recruiting new clients is such a competitive thing and it's such a big deal in this business. Agents who are representing players in this year's draft are already recruiting clients for next year's draft. And you'll have even, even guys who are not going to get drafted will have 10, 15 agents recruiting them. That's how competitive it is. There's roughly 800 agents that are certified, 150 to 200 new agents a year. And now remember, there's only 1,700 players. That's how competitive it is. Roughly 40% of all certified agents don't have a single client in the NFL, not one. They're starving and they're desperate. And that's what causes them to, to cut corners and, and uh, break rules. I used to get kind of freaked out and really nervous when I would go to meet with a, a potential client because I, I want to sign them. I'm, I'm competitive, right? I'm a very competitive person. But I remember there was a, a time I was going to meet with a, a player who I really wanted to sign. And I, I was early, so I was just about to leave my hotel room and I stopped and I, I meditated a little bit, and I just said this prayer. I said, you know, all I have is this right here. This is what I'm selling. If they pick me, this is what they're choosing. And I've been in situations where it didn't work quite right. So I just asked God, help them see me for who I am, who I really am. And if that works for them, great, then we're probably going to have a great relationship. And help, whatever's supposed to happen, help that happen. And that might mean that I'm not supposed to sign that player. It took a, a, a lot for me to get there. It's not easy. It hasn't been easy for me. But it's been really helpful. And I think I'm now signing players I'm supposed to sign. And it's really about this discussion that we've been having at Narrate Church about the conflict between being willful, which sometimes is a really good and important thing, and sometimes just letting whatever's supposed to happen, happen. And about the conflict between those two things and how do we know the difference. 
It hasn't been easy for me because I tend to be willful. I want to just plow through, right? And I'm learning as I get older that sometimes I need to be more over here. I want to leave you with one last thing. My daughter, Samara, who is a level four gymnast, um, she was nervous this year before her first uh, level four meet. So we called Will Compton because he's a great motivational speaker. We said, Will, do you have some words for us? And he said, he asked Samara, he said, have you done this before, like in practice or something? And she said, yeah. Yeah, I have. And he said, then your body knows what to do. Don't let your mind get in the way. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for having me.